So the next part that we would be covering is part two, playing the game, which is the actual rules of the game. <clears throat> First chapter of this section covers the use of ability scores. And of course you have six ability scores, strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, charisma. And the way that they kind of handle ability scores here is you no longer have your fortitude reflex well saving throws. You have saving throws for every ability score. So every ability score is tied to a saving throw. Every ability score is tied, or most of your ability scores are tied to skills. They actually have a breakdown of it here. Uh, as far as skills go. The ability checks... Constitution has nothing, which is standard. Constitution usually doesn't have anything. Dexterity has three. Strength has one. Athletics. Dexterity has acrobatics, sleight of hand, and strength. Er, stealth, not strength. My bad. Intelligence and Wisdom have the most. Uh, intelligence has Arcana, History, Investigation, Nature, and Religion. So, four knowledge skills and then Investigation, which is kind of a new one. Uh, it kind of seems like the just, you know, give me a hint skill, but it also kind of seems like the intellectual equivalent of Perception, which is interesting. I kind of like that idea. Wisdom, you have animal, animal handling, insight, medicine, perception, and survival. All of those should probably make sense. Medicine is basically just heal. And then charisma, you have deception, bluff, intimidation, performance, and persuasion, diplomacy. And the way that skills work now is... If you are proficient with a skill, which you can get that from a class, you can get that from a background, you may occasionally get that from a race or something like that. But uh, if you have skill proficiency, then you are able to add your proficiency bonus, which goes from, I believe, 2 to 6, based on how what level you are. You get to add that to your skill. So it's a lot it's, it's very simplified, again, from the rank system of Pathfinder and 3.5. Uh, a bit closer to the 4th edition system, which was basically, if you were trained in a skill, then you got a certain bonus, and beyond that, you didn't really worry about it again. Once you were trained in it, that was it. So that's the skill system. You basically, everything is basically an ability check, and then... If a skill is relevant, then, and in most cases it would be, it's not like you don't make skill checks anymore. Uh, but if a skill is relevant and you are proficient in, it, proficient in it, then you add your bonus. Or any bonuses that you might get from other sources. Uh, the other thing with skills is that a lot of them are tied into tools. Like performance, I believe you would need to have an instrument. Something like that, you know. Uh, they bring back pass passive checks from 4th edition, which is something I like. Uh, basically, a passive check is you get to take your skill. You get, you, get, you get a passive score and a skill, usually perception, which is 10 plus whatever your modifier is. And the DM uses your passive score to determine whether or not you notice certain things. Like secret doors. Things you wouldn't ordinarily look for on your own. The DM uses your passive, your passive check to see if you notice. So, I, I like the fact that they brought that back. It makes it a little simpler in terms of handling things like secret doors and stealth creatures and other things like that. And then they have working together, which basically covers group checks. 
the way a group check works is everybody makes a check and as long as at least half the group succeeds at that particular check then the group succeeds so like if you're trying to avoid getting lost everybody makes a survival check if at least half of you make it you don't get lost if half or more of you fail you're lost so that's another thing that will speed that uh, might speed certain situations up if you don't have to worry about like if well if some of them fail then what do I do now so um, the pretty much the actually the actually is the situation they express here is uh, for example, when the adventurers are navigating a swamp, the DM might call for a group wisdom survival check to see if the characters can avoid the quicksand, sinkholes, and other natural hazards of the environment. If at least half the group succeeds, the successful characters are able to guide their companions out of danger. Otherwise, the group stumbles into one of these hazards. So, expressed that way, it seems like kind of a way to fast forward through certain sections which you may not otherwise role play out which can be helpful in some cases but your mileage may vary there and then basically what it goes through after that is what you use each ability check for and what each skill kind of references and that's pretty much all that this section covers here is what each ability score kind of goes towards and then it covers the saving throws and then that's it I was actually kind of surprised on how short these chapters were in comparison to part one and part three part one is probably the longest overall part three is long for one very specific reason which I will get to when we get there but for now, uh, we have the adventuring chapter to cover. This basically covers what goes on outside of combat. And uh, essentially this covers travel pace, uh, time. It has a really good breakdown of how to handle time. Like, I'll kind of go through this here with you. In situations where keeping track of the passage of time is important, the DM determines the time a task requires. The DM might use a different time scale depending on the context of the situation at hand. In a dungeon environment, the adventurer's movement happens on a scale of minutes. It takes them about a minute to creep down a long hallway, another minute to check for traps and on the door at the end of the hall, and a good ten minutes to search the chamber beyond for anything interesting or valuable. In a city or wilderness, a scale of hours is often more appropriate. Adventurers eager to reach the lonely tower at the heart of the forest hurry across those 15 miles in just under four hours' time. For long journeys, a scale of days works best. Following the road from Baldur's Gate to Waterdeep, the adventurers spend four uneventful days before a goblin, an goblin ambush interrupts their journey. In combat and other fast-paced situations, the game relies on rounds, a six-second span of time described in chapter 9. And then we cover movement, stuff going on while traveling, the environment, various, you know, logistical stuff, I guess you could call it, vision, how to handle light, has a section on social interaction, which can be a very helpful section <clears throat> which can be a very helpful section if you are um, trying to get somebody who's maybe not as well versed in role playing in, into the approach to role playing and they basically cover the active approach to role playing and the descriptive approach to role playing, which is basically either role playing your character or describing what your character does. So that's a that's a section that I appreciate that 
they kind of give you the explanation of they kind of give you that little part on how to handle role playing and uh, then they also cover resting the resting rules in the game are a little different than they were in 4th edition and there were no resting rules at all in 3.5 and Pathfinder so you now have short rests which allow you to spend hit dice hit dice are kind of handled in the same way that healing surges were basically you have a number of hit dice equal to your level I think let me make sure yeah so you have a number of hit dice equal to your level and you can spend those hit dice to roll them and add your constitution modifier I was checking if you got to do that you roll the hit die or dice or however many you want to spend during a short rest and you add them to your health but you can only do that up to the maximum amount of hit die you have so if you're a first level character you can only do that once and beyond that short rest don't give you any benefit until you take a long rest and a long rest is a period of eight hours so it's basically sleep and you get to regain all lost hit points and you get to get all of your hit dice back to spend so you know makes makes things go a little faster I guess whether or not you like that's kind of up to you I don't I don't know how I feel about ever, people getting all of their energy back in one night but they kind of explain how hit points work a little better here and it makes a little more sense although there are still some issues with it but somewhere in here I think it's in combat but somewhere they kind of explain that hit points the, the way that the system kind of intends you to treat hit points are that you don't actually take a wound until, you t until you've suffered half your hit points in damage. And um, at that point you've kind of got minor wounds. And then um, once you drop below zero hit points you've kind of taken a major blow. So that's kind of the way that it works. So I guess if your hit points haven't if you haven't fallen below zero hit points it makes a little more sense that you can get everything back in one night but if you have fallen below zero hit points you're not gonna be okay in one night you're gonna need longer than that to heal that was me itching my nose I was not picking it and then they cover what kinda goes on between uh, adventures They introduce some interesting things you can do during downtime, like uh, crafting, practicing a, practicing a profession, recuperation, research, training, all kinds of things, really. And that does it for the adventures section. Then we get to combat. And uh, basically their step-by-step -step explanation of combat goes like this. You determine surprise first, so you see if anyone's surprised. You establish where everybody is in relation to each other. That, I think, more applies to... Well, I guess it would also apply to a battle mat, but this system is intended to be played, if desired, without a battle mat. Without a grid, essentially. So that's kind of another part of it. Uh, you roll initiative, so you determine what order everybody's going to go in, and then you take your turns. So, fairly straightforward, pretty much like it has been before. Uh, let's see. In terms of your turn, what you can do. On your turn, you can move a distance up to your speed and take one action. You decide whether to move first or take your action first. And sometimes you can get bonus actions. So that's not that different from 3.5 and Pathfinder. 
you have a move action, you have a standard. You have a move action and you have a standard action. So there's there's not too much difference there. And let's keep going through here. Uh, later in the chapter, it kind of outlines what constitutes an action. Uh, you can kind of mer you they merge a lot of actions into being part of a move or just being things you can do on your turn. So there's a lot of streamlining of the action economy. <clears throat> and then the other thing you get is a reaction. So once per round, you can do something to react to something that someone else is doing. Unless you have a class feature that gives you a specific reaction, this is usually going to be an attack of opportunity. You don't provoke attacks of opportunity from being prone and getting up anymore, which is something that was in place in 4th edition. Uh, covers creature sizes, things like that. Actions in combat. They list attack. They list spellcasting. That's an action. They list dash, which gives you an extra move action. They list disengage, which is sort of a, soup, a, a better version of withdraw from Pathfinder, and I think it might have been in 3.5. I'm less familiar with that system, so I couldn't tell you, but basically what disengage does is your movement doesn't provoke opportunity attacks for the rest of the turn. So you can move anywhere you want without provoking as long as you do it in that turn. You have dodge, which allows you to impose disadvantage on attack rolls against you. You can help someone else do something. So it's sort of like aid another. And you can hide. You can also ready an action and you can search and you can use an object. And then, of course, it gives, you know, anything that's not covered by that, you kind of improvise. One of the things that they ex that they say a lot, that they do a lot of in the combat section and in this whole part two section in general, is they sort of leave it up to the DM's discretion. So the rules don't, don't uh, clearly define a lot of things as, like, they, they aren't as precise as, I suppose you might say. It's kind of left more up to the DM to make the decisions, which can be a good thing and can be a bad thing. Because, you know, it can be a good thing in that it kind of gives, it kind of puts on the DM the onus of making the decision, and that can be a good thing in that it basically says to the DM, you know what, you just do what you want to do. And these are guidelines here that's kind of the way that's kind of the way the whole book is it's sort of modular um, you don't have to use anything you don't want to use and they kind of built it that way so that's another thing that does kind of seem like it would be interesting to work with is the modularity of it but uh, it does seem to put a lot of onus on the DM to make decisions which as long as you have a group of people who are who are friends, like people who know each other and know the DM, I think that will generally work out fairly well because you're not going to get into arguments about rules because generally in a group of friends you have an agreement that you know we're not going to get into disputes like we're just going to play. In a group of strangers, I can see this system having that problem, though, where a player won't really know the DM well enough to trust them enough to go with what they rule. So, like, if a DM makes a ruling that goes against a player who they don't know, then the player might start to argue. And the book, in some cases, doesn't really give you what you... It doesn't really... 
give you something that you can point to and just be like, this is why I said you can't do this. It, it, get, it basically says the DM tells you whether or not you can do this. And that has to be good enough for the player. So it's kind of on the player, really, too. You know, I said the onus is on the DM, but it's kind of on the player, really, too, to go along with that. You know, whatever the DM says, you kind of need to go with in this system. So mileage may vary there. And making an attack is pretty straightforward and self-explanatory. It's not really much different from how it would have been before. Uh, you have contests, which are uh, basically, you know, opposed skill checks, opposed ability checks in this case. Two weapon fighting, you can make an additional attack as a bonus action. Grappling, shoving a creature is kind of the new version of bull rush. They don't really, they don't really go into since it's simplified. Since this system is simplified, they don't really go into all the various other combat maneuvers like trip, disarm, etc. I'm sure you could use those. It would just kind of be up to the DM to decide how that works. Because they've they've kind of worked out grapple, shove, etc. So I'm sure you could do that. It would just, you know, the DM would kind of decide how it works. So it's kind of up to the DM. Uh, cover. I liked their cover system. They have half cover, they have three quarters cover, and they have total cover. I like the three different tiers there. Half cover is basically if half your body is covered. Three, cutter, three quarters is if half is if three quarters of your body is covered, and total cover is if your entire body is in, is not visible to the attacker. Damage and healing. They have more damage types. So you have acid, bludgeoning, cold, fire, force, lightning, necrotic. Necrotic is probably one of the new ones that 3.5 and Pathfinder people might hear. Piercing, poison. Uh, poison's another one. Psychic, radiant, slashing, thunder. Thunder is basically sonic damage. But that's those are pretty much the same as they were in 4th edition. It's just... They didn't have slashing, bludgeoning, and piercing, so they have those now. And you have damage, resistance, and vulnerability. Very simple. Um, resistance halves damage from a particular damage type. Vulnerability doubles it. So again, fits in with the theme of simplification of the system. Healing covers just getting health back, which is fairly simple. And then they cover when you drop to zero hit points. Uh, way that works. You have death saving throws. You can also die instantly, but that's only if you take massive amounts of damage. Like if you have... Like, if you take damage that would bring you below your hit point maximum, like, let's say, the example they give here is, uh, for example, a cleric with a maximum of 12 hit points currently has 6 hit points. If she takes 18 damage from an attack, she is reduced to 0 hit points, but 12 damage remains. Because the remaining damage equals her hit point maximum, the cleric dies. So you have to get hit really hard to die from that. It's probably not going to happen too often. Um, one thing I don't like about the system is their death saving throws, because your constitution does not figure in. I guess you could say it already sort of does in the term, in terms of your hit points are based on your constitution, at least loosely, and your constitution... And, and that's how Constitution figures into whether or not you die. But basically, death saving throws are handled the same way that they were in 4th edition. You, um, <clears throat> you can fail three times 
up to three times. And if you fail three times, then you're dead. And if you roll a 20, then you heal. If you roll a 1, you fail. If you take any damage, it automatically counts as a failure. Um, I realize that the point of the system is to simplify things, but that does seem a little too simple. Because, the, because what that introduces is you can get nickel and dimed and it counts as a failure, or you can get a bus dropped on you and it counts as a failure. There's no variation there. So, I don't know if I would use that or not. I may just use the rules as they are in 3.5 and Pathfinder, where you can take up to your constitution score, and then you're done. That's something that makes a little more sense to me. And then they have some real quick rules for underwater and mounted combat. Uh, now, one thing that I think I covered in the previous video, but in case I didn't, it's really important I cover it now, is advantage and disadvantage. And this is how they handle all sorts of things in this chapter right here. And all sorts of things in general. Basically, it is the phasing out of modifiers in the interest of keeping things more simple. Advantage, you get to roll 2d20 when you have to make a d20 roll. You take the highest of your rolls. Disadvantage, you take the lowest in that situation. And that's really all there is. It's very, very simple. The problem I see with it is that it may be a little too simple because it doesn't take into account kind of like with the death saving throw thing and you know how any damage counts as a failure it doesn't take it doesn't provide enough of an account for variation like if you are flanked you if you're flanked attackers have advantage against you if you are flanked if you're hanging upside down from the ceiling, attackers have advantage against you. If you're flanked, hanging upside down from the ceiling, and you're tied up and blind, attackers have advantage against you. There's no variation. So, I don't know if I would introduce variation in the form of modifiers on top of the advantage, introduce additional advantage rules, like you get to rule three and you take the high. That seems like it might be a little excessive. <coughs> but, I don't know. That just uh, The lack of variation there and the lack of variation with the death, death saving throws, specifically having to do with damage you take while you're down. That is kind of my... That's one of my gripes with the combat, but... All in all, it seems like it would it seems like it's very streamlined. And that was the goal, so it seems like they have accomplished that. It seems like that combat would be a lot faster, but there's um there's not really any way to find out without actually trying it. And that's kind of the reason that I've been eager to play that and some of the really cool stuff I've seen in the monster manual, which I'll do I'll do some thoughts on that too once I get through this book. But that is something that's really cool, is the whole thing with, um, ugh, what am I trying to say? Just the whole thing with this, the simplicity of it. It seems like it would be much, much faster, but the only way to really confirm that is to play it. So I can't really give you a final judgment on my thoughts on it until I do that, but just through these two parts here, some of the classes seem like they might be a little overpowered, and it seems like it may be too simple in some places, but it does seem very simple, and there is there is an emph emphasis throughout the book on giving a lot of the power to make decisions to the DM, and there is a lot of emphasis on role-playing, and not just, you know giving characters the rules and then and or giving players the rules and then they kind of have to make it up from there there is an there is a very obvious emphasis on giving characters 
things that they can use as building blocks to build a character they can roleplay. And that's one of the things I really like about it. Uh, this last section, part three,